folks. I'm Susan Morrow. I'm a volunteer for the Severeville Chamber of Commerce, and they are uh, sponsoring this for us today, and we certainly appreciate that. And we are definitely happy to have Paul Brown with us today. Our John excited I am. <laughs> I just, uh, now do you know that he wrote the book Rufus? Okay, all right. And perhaps you've all read A Death in the Family. I did, and I just thought it was fantastic. And Paul had, he was born here in Knoxville, but then at a young age they moved to California, and you lived there for many years. And he taught school for 10 years here when you moved back, and you, you started investigating the history of Knoxville since you had only lived here for a few years. So that led to, boy, this guy's great. And let me, and then suddenly his sweet little wife said, why don't you write a book? Because you've done so much research. And what a great idea you had. Anyway, um, we would like for you to turn down your cell phones if you have one. Um, and I think that's about it. And so without further ado, um, Paul Brown, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction. <laughs> uh, thanks to Carol McMahon and all the folks who put this event on every year. Uh, such a big undertaking. Uh, and I appreciate your all's interest with all the other options you had during this hour uh, as far as speakers to listen to. I, I appreciate your interest in AG and I hope uh, you know, some, something that I say this morning will, will interest you in, in maybe investigating his work further if, you, if he's not someone you've read a whole lot. Um, I've given several talks about AG at different places. Most of them are focused on his Knoxville childhood um, because those were obviously very influential years. Um, those of you that, that have read Death in the Family know what a beautiful work that is. And it's, it's the book that got me interested in reading about A.G. And it's highly autobiographical. It's based on uh, an event in 1916 when his father was driving home one night from La Follette back to Knoxville and had a car wreck. Uh, he was the only one in the car. He was the only one on the road at that hour. So the, the, uh, the cause of the accident was somewhat mysterious. But it deeply affected the family and Rufus, who almost idolized his father, grew up um, kind of with feelings of, uh, you know, lacking closure and, and feeling like he, um, his father was still continuing to haunt him. And so a lot of his work, even if not directly addressing his father, um, you know, does touch on death and um, changes that affect family life and, and stuff like that. So. Um, before you even consider buying this, I would highly recommend AG's. I, I'd much rather promote his work because that's what got me interested in in this, and especially because it's it's often um, pointed to it as an example of one of the finest works that any, of any Tennessee writer. Um, it, it often makes national lists of you know the best hundred novels of uh, the 20th century. So I, I recommend that. Um, but I also want to today highlight a little bit about Sevier County. This is my first time speaking here about AG and um, you know the nearby Smoky Mountains. It's a lot closer to the Smokies here than it is in Knoxville. Um, and those mountains influenced AG and his work. So I, I definitely also want to leave time for your questions. In fact, I need to uh, make sure I keep track of the time. Uh, so that I can do that. But, so here's a, here's a big statement for you to agree or disagree with. Uh, if not for Sevier County, James Agee would not have been born. Uh, now I thought of that the other day just based on his family history and what kind of brought his parents together and stuff. But I must admit that James Agee never lived in Sevier County. Um, and in fact, there are only you know, I looked at some old census records, and there's only a few ages that I could find in all the pre-World War II census records. Um, the 1940 census lists a small family, um, Waymond and Isaphine Agee, and their infant daughter. And then 
1920, the census for Sevier County shows that just one person, a 34-year-old married woman named Elizabeth, or Catherine Agee, um, who was living with her parents, her husband wasn't listed. So, uh, so basically in, you know, since the 1800s all the way through 1940, uh, I could only find four individuals with the last name A.G. in this county. Now, people may have moved in and out, uh, but in those census years, at least, they only found four people. Uh, the name A.G. was much more common in counties like Crockett, Smith, um, and Campbell, which is actually where A.G.'s father's uh, family came from. Um, his great-grandfather, James Harris A.G., represented Campbell County, the state legislator, the state legislature. He was a, a practiced medicine up in Campbell County. Um, A.G.'s grandfather, Henry Clay A.G., uh, was a school teacher up in that county and a farmer. Um, and then A.G.'s father, Hugh James A.G., um, he always went by James or Jay, uh, never by Hugh. Um, but Hugh James A.G., uh, A.G.'s father, uh, also taught school for a very short time. He was a lot like Lincoln. In fact, A.G. compared his father to Lincoln because his father only attended school through fourth grade. But he self-educated himself, reading constantly in his spare time. He read law books and different things. He actually built an addition onto his family's home farmhouse up in Camel County just so that he could be by himself and read after he got home from work. So that, that's a man that was really interested in uh, you know, educating, educating himself, and that's part of the reason why he moved to Knoxville, to the city, to find employment uh, as a postal worker around 1901. Um, so, so the AGs aren't represented here in S Sevier County very well. Um, AG's maternal family line, the Tylers, I was really surprised. I mean, I knew they weren't from uh, Sevier County. Uh, they actually came down from Michigan. But I was very shocked to, in all those same batch of Sevier County census records, you know, 1940 and earlier, I didn't find a single Tyler. You would think that would be a, a more common name than A.G., but I found no Tylers. I found a lot of Taylors, and, and perhaps that, that's a, a common origin for their names, but um, so the Tylers were not represented in Sevier County either. Um, James uh, A.G.'s great great or sorry great grandfather up in Michigan was Rufus Tyler. That's uh, James Rufus A.G. was named after uh, his great grandfather. Um, so basically, here's how Sevier County comes in. Um, in 1888, James A.G.'s great grandfather Rufus Tyler died. Um, he was owner of a lumber, a timber company. And his son, Joel, James A.G.'s grandfather, Joel Tyler, took over the business. But up in Michigan, he had a chronic illness every winter. Those harsh Michigan winters, uh, he, it gave him trouble every year. So after his father died, he started looking south um, to find a, a milder climate to where he could also kind of continue on the timber industry. So, um, so again, he... He started looking, and um, that's how he, he became interested in Sevier County. I'll read a little bit about this period in Tyler's history. So around that time, Joel and two or three other men up there heard about the wonderful uncut timber in the mountains of East Tennessee and how cheaply it could be bought, according to Laura, who was Joel's, uh, Joel's daughter, uh, James A.G.'s mother. Except for small local logging operations, Smoky Mountain timber had been largely untapped, partly due to any, uh, the absence of any efficient method of transporting logs. And so Laura says, they made them a party and went down into the mountains below Sevierville and bought quite a number of thousands of acres down there. It turns out it was only about 2,200 acres, but they came down and the deeds were signed here in the Sevier County Courthouse. Um, so this Joel Tyler and his timber company, they invested in this land in Sevierville. And I actually found the whole deed. There were a couple of little points on the deed that uh, the, the names were kind of obscure. They'd been changed, like there was a, a rattlesnake hollow or something like that that I could not find any reference to. 
Um, but um, part of the tract touched the, near the top of Round Top Mountain, which is um, over there. You can see it from like the, uh, the high school near Gatlinburg, um, about two and a half miles due north of Mount Laconte. Another corner touched Roaring Fork Creek, which of course is, is a, a well known spot here. So Laura said, it was wonderful timber, and Papa was the judge of that timber. He'd go through the woods and be able to calculate everything. Um, so she, James Agee's mother, remembered when Joel Tyler returned from East Tennessee on this expedition um, to try to scout out the, what the timber was like down there. And so these are her words. I remember when Papa came back to Kalamazoo from that trip, and Laura was a, about four years old at the time, but she still had this memory. She says, we were little things and didn't understand where he'd been. But he came in, I think Mama was dressing us in the morning, he was telling different things about it, how different it was down there. And they'd been invited to sleep in a cabin with a family who were being hospitable to them, but it was perfectly impossible. These three men and the whole family all in one room and no air to breathe. So they went out and slept in their tent. And so uh, she also has this memory of him bringing, pulling something out of the bag that he brought back to Michigan from from uh, Sevier County, from the woods out there. And Papa drew out a thing uh, from a satchel, a lump of something brown. And he said, what do you think that is? I said, it's a rock. He said, no, it's corn pone. They eat it down there. And then he told about some girl, she was eating green apple parings. And her mother said, don't eat no more of them apple parings, they'll make you sick. That struck me as a very peculiar thing. I got some funny impressions of the place. It was very wild, of course, in those days. So uh, you can kind of imagine these, these little kids. And she had a twin brother, Hugh, who was James Agee's uncle, who was a, a very well-known artist, uh, especially here in Knoxville. But you can imagine what these little kids were thinking. And, and to find out that they're going to move to this place where they eat stuff like that and uh, you know talk a little bit funny and you know are out in the woods and, and these little uh, log cabins, um, you know, you, you can imagine her being ex both excited and a little bit perplexed about why they were moving there. Um, so anyway, long story short, Joel abandoned the timber idea uh, because he had, he had wanted to, on this tract of land, he had heard that the railroad was going to come through there and he was really banking on uh, making a lot of money from the railroad company to, to cross his tract of property. But it turns out it never happened. Uh, and just a few years later is when uh, Colonel William Townsend started the Little River Railroad Company uh, over in the area that's now known as Townsend. And, uh, and so kind of stole, uh, stole Joel Tyler's thunder there. So anyway, he gave up on the timber idea, but somehow met um, people in the machinery business there. They made flour mill machinery. So, he partnered into a company in around 1891. The family moved down, and so uh, the Tylers, uh, Laura and Hugh, eventually finished grade school and attended UT. Laura joined an off-campus dancing class where she met a handsome postal clerk named James Agee, uh, J. Agee, if you will. They fell in love, married, spent two years in uh, Panama's Canal Zone, where Jay transferred to work as a postmaster over there. They returned to Knoxville in the fall of 1908. The following fall, uh, November 27, 1909, Laura gave birth to a son, James Rufus A.G. So that's all thanks to Sevier County, <laughs> you could say. So, um, so that's just a short lead up to where, where Rufus ties into that. Um, now, the, the family, one thing that Rufus does remember, even though he didn't live here in Sevier County, is he remembers vacationing in the Smokies. And so the, the, uh, the railroad that took him from Knoxville to um, the Elkmon and the Wonderland uh, Resort and everything, it, it didn't come up through Sevier County. It went around through Maryville and, and towns and out that way. But Elkmont was in Sevier County um, you know, before the state took it over. Uh, or the, the federal government. And so, um, so his memories of Elkmont are, are evidence that Sevier County 
you know, and obviously the Smokies had a big influence on them. Um, and so, uh, one, one of the things that, that he wrote, he has some various memories that he wrote down, but he, he has a wonderful description of the train ride from Knoxville uh, off toward Elkmont. And he says that they, they got up and went to the Ellen and Depot. And he says, um, his mother told his Uncle Ted that she liked it better than the Southern Depot because there were so many country folks, and his father said he did too. It smelled like chewing tobacco and pee, and like a barn. Uh, isn't that such a cozy smell? Uh, but anyway, they, they liked it better at the L&N compared to the Southern Depot. But uh, once, once they were nearing the Smoky Mountains, uh, there's this great description. It says, after a while, his father came hurrying back down the aisle and told his mother to look out the window. And she did and said, well, what? And he said, no, up ahead. And they all three looked up ahead, and there on the sky, above the scrubby hill, there was a grand, great lift of grayish blue that looked as if you could see the light through it. And then the train took a long curve, and these liftings of gray blue opened out like a fan and filled the whole country ahead, shouldering above each other, high and calm, full of shadowy light, so that he heard his mother say, oh, how perfectly glorious. And his father said, uh, and he heard his father say shyly, a little as if he owned them and was giving them to her. That's them. That's the Smokies all right. And, he, and sure enough, they did look smoky. They sure did this morning. And as they came nearer, smoke and great shadows seemed to be sailing around on, the, on them. But he knew that they must be clouds. After a while, he could begin to see the shapes of them clearly, great bronzy bulges that looked as if they were blown up tight like balloons and solemn deep scoops of shady blue that ran from the tops on down below the tops of the near hills. And then uh, after they, they uh, turned some more curves, said now they could see, even see the separate trees all over the sides of the mountains, like rice, all shades of green, and some almost black. And before much longer, they were climbing more slowly past the feathery tops of trees and the high shoulders of mountains. And great deep scoops were turning past them and beneath them as if they were very slowly and seriously dancing in sunlight and in cloud and in shadows almost at night. And now and then they could see a tiny cabin in a corn patch far off on the side of the mountain. And twice they even saw a tinier mule, a man with it. One of the men waved. And high above them in the changing sunlight, slowest of all, the tops of the mountains twisted and changed places. And after quite a while, his father said he reckoned they better start getting their stuff together and before much longer they got off. So uh, A.G. has a way of turning what could be to some people just a view of, hey, look at those mountains. He has a way of uh, describing them in such uh, rich detail in these long sentences with, uh, with few commas. Um, but he just has a way of bringing you into that scene and making you appreciate it. And um, I think that's one thing you'll find when you read A.G. He didn't always write about Southern things, but his major works were. I mean, if you think about A Death in the Family, set in Tennessee, um, there's a, a shorter novel, less, less well-known, it's called The Morning Watch, that covers, that's a, a brief period of time fictionalized when he was a student down at St. Andrew's School, down in, near Sewanee, um, Franklin County. And then there's, of course, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, which is uh, a great piece, almost without category. It's journalism, it's documentary, but it's, uh, it's very much, in a lot of ways, focused on A.G. and how living with these cotton tenant farmers affected him personally, almost as much as it is about those, those people he stayed with that summer in 1936. Um, so, uh, so anyway, Sevier County and Smokies definitely affected James Ag. Um, he he remembered those vacations fondly um, and cherished the me memories as memories of his father, who, uh, as I said, died in 1916. Uh, we know James Ag from novels like *Death in the Family*, *Morning Watch*, screenplays. If you didn't know, he wrote this Oscar-nominated screenplay, *The African Queen*, um, lesser-known movie, but but. A, great movie directed by Charles Lawton, Night of the Hunter. Uh, he worked on that screenplay. Um, he also was well known um, toward the end of his life for his 
film reviews um, for, and for his articles for Time Magazine, Life Magazine, and The Nation. Um, but App Appalachian Mountain settings appear in a number of his lesser known works. Um, when he was, after his family left Knoxville, he, he studied down in Sewanee uh, at the Episcopal Boarding School. He came back for one year at Knoxville High School um, for his junior year of high school in 1924-25. And then his family moved um, out. He, he uh, attended Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, prestigious prep school up there. And so, but by then, he was writing, he was submitting pieces to uh, the school literary journal. Um, he, he had a couple uh, short plays that he wrote all at Exeter. Uh, one was Catched and one was Any Seventh Son. There are two short plays he wrote that had Appalachian settings. Uh, he composed a poem there, Anne Gardner, which he later, which later appeared in his award-winning book of poetry, Permit and Voyage. Um, and it, it definitely has, it, it never says Smoky Mountains or Appalachia, but um, you, you get a sense of those, um, those settings. Um, in fact, he says this poem more or less gave me a chance to say everything I had to say or feel about nature and death. And it's like a folk ballad. Um, descriptions of the stark, unnamed hill country suggest the mountains of Appalachia, a rugged land cultivated by equally rugged people. And here, here are some lines from that poem and Garner. Now the blue plowshare surged in the broad fields, the black earth riven by the flame-like blade, in sinuous furrows fur followed or flowed behind. Anne watched the plunging and inexorable plow, watched her husband guiding it. And when the work was done, and over the quiet hills, the sky glowed greenly, stealing out alone. Anne pressed her body to the raw, rich earth and felt life swelling great against lost stones. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a <coughs> folk ballad. It has kind of a mystical quality to it as far as how Anne is, is connected to the earth. Uh, she becomes increasingly reclusive and bound to the cycles of the land around her, as in these lines. And after that, she scarcely lived within the cabin's walls, but with the cattle moving up the mountain. Then in the swaying dimness of the forest, she lay beneath the gnarled mountain laurel, or on the cool and calm of fallen oak leaves, and heard the rush of the wind among the leaves, the subtle writhe and shiver of an earth forever tortured by the myriad roots sprawling in darkness downward. So uh, kind of dark, uh, kind of melancholy image, imagery there, but definitely um, founded on his, his knowledge of these mountains that are so close to us here. Uh, when he was at Harvard, he, he attended Harvard after Philip Exeter. I found in, uh, so far unpublished, um, UT Press is doing like a 12-volume set of AG's work, including, you know, more than half of what we knew about A.G. was unpublished. Um, and so this, they're, they're scholarly books. It's called The Works of James A.G. They, they're only about halfway through it right now. And so one of the next ones to come out is poetry and short fiction. But they have all these screenplays. There's, uh, of course, there, there is a scholarly edition of A Death in the Family. Those of you who have read this one and appreciate it might, might want to check out from the library the one that uh, UT professor Michael LaFaro edited, found like 10 new chapters, and based on AG's notes, um, kind of argued that AG's original editor that edited this book after AG died uh, did not follow AG's outlines and discarded a lot of uh, material because he felt it wasn't marketable. <coughs> And in fact, as most of you know, this book won the Pulitzer Prize in 1957, um, not 58, May of 1958, it won the Pulitzer Prize and was later adapted as a Pulitzer Prize winning stage play. And then of course in 1962, uh, Paramount Pictures came to Knoxville and actually to Cage Cove area to film the movie version of this starring Robert Preston and um, the actress Jean Simmons. Uh, which is uh, a great movie. It, it wasn't as lauded as the, the novel and the play work, but it was uh, kind of an obscure uh, jewel, if, if you can find it nowadays. Um, 
So anyway, um, Agee's work is becoming more and more well known uh, as, as these previously unpublished works are coming out. Um, <coughs> Uh, the Smokies even inspired uh, a poem, lines suggested by a Tennessee song, in which A.G. retells the nativity story in App Appalachian setting and dialect. So the manger is a cold black barn. The awestruck shepherds are slaves laboring on the mountainside. And one of the gifts presented to this child king is ginseng root from Siler's Bald, uh, which is scenic area on the Appalachian Trail. Um, <laughs> Of course, the, the poet could not resist a hillbilly stereotype when he said that Mary's betrothed was Joseph, a cousin from down in the down in the uh, So he, he had to throw that in, of course, which is definitely a, an Appalachian stereotype. But Ag was actually, you know, he he worked his whole career was in New York and Los Angeles when he was doing screenplays for Hollywood. But, but he was very sensitive and aware of the way that Southerners were portrayed in the media. Um, and you would think that a, you know, kind of a, a member of the, you know, intelligent, literate, uh, liberal crowd would, uh, would kind of be aloof to that, I, I, I would say. But he never forgot his Southern roots. And so he was always kind of, um, you know, French remarked on his his kind of fixation with it. He would uh, his Harvard roommate remembers that he would read poems by Shelley, but in a, a, a deep East Tennessee accent, just just for fun. But he was always bringing in, tying in his uh, experiences from his childhood. But like I said, he was very aware of these Southern stereotypes. And as a film reviewer, he came across material sometimes that really offended him because of, of its, how it portrayed, kind of flippantly portrayed uh, hillbillies. Um, so in one of these, uh, I don't know if you all have seen the film Tennessee Johnson, uh, 1943 film starring Van Heflin. It's, it's about uh, President Andrew Johnson, who of course isn't one of our more popular presidents, but um, that was, they actually had a regional premiere in Knoxville at the Tennessee Theater just down the street from the Andrew Johnson Hotel, where they had kind of a big soiree um, to go along with the film premiere. Um, but here's, here's this review actually for The Nation magazine in uh, 1943. It got cut down, so a lot of the East Tennessee references were taken out. But here's a little bit of what he wrote in response to the film Tennessee Johnson. Uh, he was writing this from New York. He says, since I made, since I am even more ignorant of the history of my country than most Americans of my age, I can't join the quarrel over Tennessee Johnson on any question of basic facts. And since I got in late, I can't say much about the way East Tennesseans were handled, though I know more about East Tennessee. I saw enough to be sure of this, that the dialects ranged all the way from Seaboard Women's College drama to the old homestead, and that there was not an East Tennessean face in the crowd that little boys should not be presented in new straw hats neatly scissored into imitation ruggedness, and that Van Heflin, now and, now and then, by looking like Richard Barthelmess in the first production of Tolerable David, was at least more convincing than anyone else in the crowd. I see no possible excuse for this careless mixture of worn-out, stiff, traditional, rural types, regarding it as a libel on a common man whom it is supposed to flatter and a neglect of one of the most elementary requirements and opportunities of films. And I doubt whether Shakespeare himself could have gotten away with the lightning transition in which, within three minutes, people who had been on the verge of lynching Van Heflin are ready to elect him sheriff. It takes longer than that for an East Tennessean to scratch himself. <laughs> so obviously, he wasn't very impressed with the, the Southern depictions, of course, uh, <coughs> Andrew Johnson uh, lived for, for a time in Greenville, uh, so not, not too far away. Um, now, in April 1946, A.G. saw Disney's film Make Mine Music, which some of you may have uh, grown up watching. It's an anthology of little animated vignettes set to popular music. Um, and A.G. was, of course, I, I say this, you know, driving down the main drag through 
uh, Sevierable in Pigeon Forge, you see all kinds of hillbilly stereotypes. So you, you wonder what Agee's thinking, you know, when he sees a big billboard about uh, the Hatfield McCoy duel dinner show and uh, stuff like that. But it's funny because he, he picked out of this Disney film a segment that was basically a parody or a play on the Hatfield McCoy uh, image, which, which is still uh, being, being portrayed nowadays. So he was offended by this segment. And here's what he wrote in The Nation in April 1946 about Make Mine Music. I try to realize that it is a perfectly harmless, innocent, proficient, appropriate attempt to set several pieces of popular music. But that helps my sense of proportion little, if at all. I know that much of the best in Disney's films comes of his ruralness, and I respect it. But towards some aspects of rural taste, the best I can muster is a polite, if nauseated smile. Of such, this picture is a reasonably definitive anthology. There is an infinitely insulting <coughs> animation of a hillbilly ballad, which I cannot doubt that many hillbillies will love, a fact which grieves me all the more because I have hillbilly blood myself. So he was, uh, in a very articulate way, um, defending an accurate view of what being a Southerner is. Uh, so, uh, so again, this all comes from his experience in East Tennessee, uh, his experiences in the mountains, vacationing in the, in the Smoky Mountains, um, I'm sure running into mountain folk. I mean, his, uh, his father's people grew up in the mountains of Camel County on the Cumberland Plateau, or just at the foot of it. And so um, he, he knew these people. He, he wrote about the mountaineers who were kind of the backbone of, of this country. And so he, he really boiled his blood just about to see them uh, mocked on, on the screen or, or in other pieces of fiction. Um, but it's interesting that just a few months before he wrote that review of Make My Music, A.G. Hitt and his third wife, Mia, were actually contemplating moving from Manhattan uh, and moving out to the country because A.G. felt like, you know, he, he always longed for the country. In fact, once he said that, um, that out of any place he could live, uh, he felt the most at home in Tennessee or at least in the South. And this is a man, again, who had lived, who could, you know, he wasn't rich but because he wasn't always that responsible with money. But I mean, he lived in Manhattan where it was a happening place. He, he uh, you know, got to, to meet and, and even collaborate with Charlie Chaplin. He met John Houston and wrote the screenplay of African Queen with John Houston. And so he knew all these people and could live pretty much wherever he wanted to, but he, he held on to this idea of the South and Tennessee being his home, which I think is significant. And one of the things I, I wanted to do in Rufus, um, using his childhood nickname there, is to show how influential Tennessee really was um, on his life and his uh, profession. But just a couple months before A.G. wrote this uh, review of Make My Music, he, he again was was contemplating moving to the country. So at that time, his mother Laura, who had remarried in 1925, um, she remarried a clergyman from uh, St. Andrews. His name was Erskine Wright. So she became Laura Wright. And in 1946, she had moved from Maine um, and, and New England back to uh, St. Andrews School down in near Sewanee. And um, she ended up going back to New England after her second husband died in 1950 or 51, somewhere around there. Um, but anyway, 1946, she's, she's offering him advice about where in the country he maybe should look. And so she wrote this letter. Interestingly, she wrote this um, about 74 years ago this week. She wrote it on February 19, 1946. And here's what she writes. Dearest Rufus, as to your yearning to get out of town and find some mode of work permitting it, we both of us, including her, her husband, fully understand it and wish you might and wish you may. We feel you should give it a thorough trying out, however, before you would think of buying a place or even selecting a permanent locality. 
This mountain country of Tennessee is exceedingly lovely. And if it did not prove to be too far away from your markets, which as you say would be north, it would seem of itself a place that would satisfy you very much. At this time, there is not only a shortage of houses in this region, meaning down near Sewanee, but there aren't any at all available for rent. People come here to St. Andrews begging to rent, and neither in Sewanee or in the country is there an empty house. My thoughts, though, turn to Gatlinburg, in that very wonderful Smoky Mountain country, which seems to me far more beautiful than this. I recall an old woman we drove into Sevierville, picked her up on the road. She and her old husband moved back and east of Gatlinburg a mile or so. And at that time, we had an idea of uh, would have been glad to sell or rent or board people. The views from their locality were great beyond description, and I would certainly think the ideal way would be, if you could, to get to know some such people, rent a house on their place, perhaps, with use of their spring, etc. <coughs> and if you got uh, sure of liking it, probably buying from them at a very reasonable figure. Wild land here on the mountain sells at about $4 an acre. But that means entirely away from roads and with no human improvements at all, of course. And now, with the outlook of such awful shortage of building materials, it would seem pretty hopeless to try to build within any short uh, sort of time at all. So uh, then she goes on to, because A.G. had been married three times and uh, was not known at that time for his devoutness, um, you know, he, he always, uh, I would love to do a study about A.G.'s um, AG's faith. He, he uh, grew up Episcopal. He kind of drew away from the church as he got into more, uh, kind of leaned more into the artistic literary world. But, um, but he carried on this correspondence from 1925 to 1955, the year he died, 30 year uh, correspondence of, uh, between uh, or with Father James Harold Fly who was his teacher down in uh, St. Andrews, and a real mentor. And um, no matter what A.G. felt like, he could talk to uh, through letters uh, and in person, uh, because A.G. actually came back through Tennessee several times in his, during his professional career. And he would stop at St. Andrews and, and always visit the flies. And uh, so anyway, uh, Laura, though, knows that Agee's not an orthodox uh, religious person, and so uh, knew that the fathers or the, the leaders of the school, a uh, religious campus, uh, would kind of be a little bit uncomfortable about her son being that close. And Laura actually says that, which is uh, kind of awkward to read, because uh, she says, We'd love, you know, we'd love to have, have you come see us too and Mia with you and, and that this might be quite frequent. But as to the matter of having you come visit us here, it would not be the same as if this were our house and we were on our own place. I know by the way you wrote that you fully guessed this. This place so wholly belongs to the order, the order of the Holy Cross who, um, who led the school at that time and is so entirely under the okay of Bishop Campbell. And as you know, he is very stiff about these things. And of course, it's very right and understandable that he should be, as the order is a definite leader in taking a stand about the church's teaching on marriage, etc., etc. Therefore, we are not free agents in this sense. Um, but anyway, she suggested, but if you, if you live up in Sevier County or Gatlinburg, you know, that's not too far to drive if we wanted to visit, you know, regularly, but still at much of a... Keeping, keeping somewhat of a distance just to please the... So it's kind of an awkward letter. Um, uh, over, I don't know, about a week later, you know, within the week, A.G. basically writes to her and says that he and his wife decided to move up to Hillsdale, New York. So upstate New York, where they could find a, a farmhouse. And that's actually the property that the family still owns up there. Uh, A.G. was buried on, on the land up there in a, in a private ceremony after his death. But... Laura responds on February 27, 1946. She says, um, we do feel it will turn out to be a really better location for you than in Tennessee on account of your work, even though Tennessee never loosens hold of those who have really seen it. But all the same, to be in the hills and in the real country anywhere is a rest to the spirit and the mind, as well as a quiet tonic and strengthener. And it is a grand feeling sprung from deep roots in us mortals 
to own a piece of land and our own roof tree. So, uh, so it's even though AG never lives in Sevier County or Cerebral, this county helped draw the family together. Uh, and the area also shapes AG's memories about Black Jet and influenced his work. And his mother's comments show uh, too how much she appreciated the area and, and what a uh, what a peaceful place it was in, in her memory. So um, I, I greatly appreciate your time, and I'm wondering if, if any of you have any questions you'd like to. Uh, this might, I, I wish I had left more. This. Who did his mother end up living? Was she in Tennessee in Campbell's? Really? She, um, so after her husband, her second husband died um, down at uh, St. Andrew's School, uh, and he was buried there in, on the campus cemetery. She moved to Connecticut, okay. uh, Kent, Connecticut, I believe, which is where her twin brother Hugh okay. uh, lived out the rest of his life. Let me tell you one thing. Yes. You said Rams, uh, Rattlesnake Hall. Mm -hmm. There's, I know where Rattlesnake Hall is. Oh, wow. My friend Francis is eight years old, and it was her grandfather's farm that's kind of parallel in uh, Gordon Fork. Mm -hmm. I said, Francis, how did he how did his name? Because he would have owned it in the late eighteen hundreds. Yeah. She said, All the rattlesnakes. He was a oh. farmer, but all the rattlesnakes were there. Oh wow. And then you mentioned Walt Disney. I'm sorry, I got to take Oh sorry. <laughs> so you know, Walt Disney came here in nineteen fifty and spent a month. At Buck Corny, did you know that? I I heard that yeah, he flew into Knoxville, but um, really was because out there on, on the North Carolina side of the the Smokies, I don't know if that's when he was looking for a place to film the, the Davy Crockett that's series. That's exactly right, mm -hmm. yes. And I, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the the center there, just on the North Carolina side of where they ended up filming there. But but yeah, I heard, and I was really interested to yeah. find out Yeah, he stayed a month, and then he went out to visit Colonel Townsend's third wife, Alice. Oh, interesting. Her house is burned in 1967, mm -hmm. but when he made the movie Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, mm -hmm. he had in the Seven Dwarfs house after Miss Alice. Really? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> there in Townsend? No, where, where was well, it? Elmont. Oh, Elmont. Elmont. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, man. That's, that's a great where story. people go today to see the fireflies. Right. Right by mm -hmm. where her house sits. Oh, wow. That's a great story. <laughs> How many of you uh, said that you had read A Death in the Family before? So about roughly half. Um, again, um, th this book, uh, what inspired me to write it was reading this and the fact that it, it set there in Knoxville and the surrounding um, area. Whoops. Um, I, I was fascinated. I was incredibly moved. Wanted to find out more about the family. And just out of a personal interest set off researching his family. And so, um, like I said, there's there's things that I still am discovering because I, I have, trouble, have trouble whipping myself away from it. So maybe one of these days I'll get to um, to add to this, but... Um, Do you but, have pictures of A.G. what he looked like? Was he tall, dark? He, he was. I don't have... Um, I think I Because I know an A.G. that lives in this county. Oh, really? Mitch A.G. Oh, interesting. <laughs> There is, there is one here, uh, this is when he was at Harvard, I believe. That's at least what the back of the photo said. Um, he was very tall, dark, dark featured, blue eyed, uh, just like his father and, and grandfather and, and on. So uh, it'd be interesting to find out if his family had originally come from the Campbell side. Uh, yes. But, uh, but yeah, there's a, a ton of pictures in there. Most of them have to do with his, his childhood and Kind of the the area that he would have recognized as as a young boy. Um, the letter that you um, uh, referenced with the mother writing about Gallagher. Mm -hmm. Do you have that information in that book as well? It, I mention it. Uh, I think I mentioned. Wonderful. Yeah, and that that came from um, the James A. G. Collection at UT, uh, University of Tennessee Special Collections. They have uh, a bunch of letters from the forties and fifties. Uh, from between A.G. and his mother. And it's interesting because she always opens it, Dearest Rufus, oh. just about in every one. Mm -hmm. So um, that was definitely a name that even though he professionally went by James A.G. and answered to that, or Jim, 
Um, Rufus, he, he continued to kind of answer to that among people that knew him best. And it, to me, represents his identity that was formed here in Tennessee. Uh, do, you, do you know when they tore his home place down in Knoxville? What was, I guess, there was no, no one trying to preserve that or restore Not at that it? time. There, you know, it got some mentions in the local paper, and, and it was photographed, at least from a particular angle. Um, and Life Magazine actually came out. In 1962, in September, a um, photographer from Life Magazine came out. And then I think in 63 is when the photo spread, uh, November 63 in Life Magazine, uh, different photos of his life. Uh, that, that was the year that the movie came out. But it's, it's one of those like uh, things that his house uh, started being torn down in September of 62. Um, and it was just like homes, any home at that time was kind of getting run down and they wanted to put in a big, ugly uh, brick apartment building on the site. Uh, so, that, of course, of course, landlords are free to do that and they, you know, can get a whole lot more money um, per month from, from tenants uh, if there's a bigger, bigger building on the same lot. But the frustrating thing is Hollywood came and began shooting almost exactly a month later. And they said, if we had gotten in time and gotten all the permissions from the developers and everything to shoot it, we would have shot the movie using that house. But they missed it by weeks. And it's extremely frustrating. Uh, nowadays, I think Knoxville's come a very long way in uh, appreciating old buildings. You see it downtown. Development has, you know, using, revitalizing old buildings for new purposes has spread in all directions uh, out of downtown. So, but at that time, there just wasn't that that mindset and that appreciation. Uh, so, yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, but Knoxville does have a park that was dedicated in 2005, um, just a block block south of where AG lived. It's just a small little park with a little looping trail, uh, flowers. And, um, but it gives you a sense, just looking around the, the houses of what the neighborhood was like. Highland Avenue in Knoxville, um, there's still, I mean, you know, it's frustrating that his house was gone, but it's surprising how many examples of that architecture are still there on that street, on that block. Um, there's this, that street that goes by where his house was, is named James H. Street. Knoxville's had, um, conferences over the years, um, co-sponsored by the city and UT. And so, and like I said, UT Press is coming out with this uh, set of complete work, uh, complete works of James Agee, that I don't know when the last volume will be published, but it's it's exciting to know that the public will have access to, to these works that have never seen the light of day, so, yeah. yes. I'm sorry, um, you're related to the introduction, you mentioned that you taught, have you taught um, a death in the family to students before, or? No, in fact, um, I taught K through 12 music okay. Okay. out in Morgan County for 10 years, and so this this was totally not my area of expertise. I, uh, my my wife Jessica was an English major at UT, um, but I it's just something I I picked up out of interest. So uh, so yeah, I've never taught it. I would. I would uh, students would get a sense of my obsession about it, I think, if I weren't a teaching class, but... Uh. I just wondered if you had... I, I uh, read the small Appalachian Cultural Center over at Carson Newman and mm -hmm. teach an English department. Very I thought this would be fantastic to be able to teach that and then to perhaps have you come and inspire them to look at him in new and fresh ways. Sure. Because I know it's not an older, older novel, mm -hmm. but it's sometimes hard to get yeah. students to look back even yeah. 60, 70 years. Right. Yeah. I think the, the most fun... And again, it's probably why I, I may not have been as interested in AG had I not moved back to Knoxville as an adult and started to see this rich history and uh, been able to read it and kind of feel and understand it as an adult and then be able to say, okay, where were these places? Where did his family live? And to be able to stand or walk past a spot uh, knowing the, the feelings that were going on there in the mind of the author uh, and the, the events that inspired him, influenced him. Um, it's really powerful if you ever, you know, anytime you get a chance to kind of stand in a spot or visit a city where uh, 
a, a, a work, even a fictional work, takes place, it's uh, really increases your appreciation. So maybe they can do like a field trip to Knoxville and spend the day. There's so much to do here. Let me check the time. Any, uh, are there any other questions? Um, do you have other research things that you're pursuing? Or are you teaching now? My wife and I are both um, freelance writers. Um, we moved to Knoxville from Clinton. Um, so I had to uh, kind of cut off my, my teaching in Morgan County and decided to jump into freelance writing. Um, I haven't done anything this, this intense, but I have written uh, a couple of essays about Frances Hodgson Burnett. I've seen that, yeah. Oh, thanks. And uh, so she's another author who... Was she next on your list? Yeah, she was, kind of. I was like, wow, this is really interesting, <laughs> looking at how a particular city influenced an author. And a lot of people are surprised about Frances Hodgson Burnett, you know, this uh, Victorian author of Secret Garden and uh, Little Lord Fauntleroy, she got her start, her career started in Knoxville when she was Newmark, 17, 18. Yeah. And David Madden over in North Carolina mm -hmm. has written about her. There's a, yeah. an innkeeper in Newmarket that's trying to keep yes. her house open. If you've met uh, her, that'd be a lovely. Yeah, Kim Stapleton. Kim Stapleton. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've I've talked to her. And well, it's, it's great for Dominic, because that would be a couple of summers ago about the Yeah, I wish I had a uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, But thank you all so much.